So we, t we have our friend Stephen Crawford here again. He is the best and the most generous with his time. Stephen is the Director of Alignment and Accountability with McGee Productivity Solutions. He also has another business, Crawford & Gray, which helps small businesses get up and moving in the Denver area. Great Good intro. You, did, you yes. did awesome. That was just off the cuff. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, she remembered all that. That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, and hosting today for us, we have uh, Stephen Andrews, who is the um, owner, proprietor, and podcast extraordinaire for Spotted Dog Media, That's our me. producer. Um, so I'm putting him in the hot seat today to uh, ask the Q&A questions. So essentially, we're just going to, I'm going to flip through these questions. We're just going to bounce back and forth between you guys. Okay, doke. And then I reserve the right to dig deeper on your questions or, awesome. and answers. So they're all organized for you. So there's they Steven. Are. She's there's such a good organizer. <laughs> and then there's questions on for both of us on the back. It's so funny that we work so well together because you're so <laughs> organized and I am just a mess. You are. We're working on you. That's we're works working though. on it. That I'm getting works. there. Building some process yep, perhaps and all that sort of you. fun yep, stuff. We're working getting on there. You. Getting so, you, he's just taken my checklist that I've created for him and yes. integrated them into his business. It's a great checklist. Uh -huh. I, I really want a credit. It. <laughs> you shall get all of the credit. So we'll start off with one for both of you. Okay. And do 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 do. Well, oh, this is a good one. What cool? <clears throat> sorry, for both of you, what is your purpose in life? <laughs> what actually drives you? Like what what gets you going? What makes you wake up in the morning? Because we all do a job, but is mm -hmm. that job what actually pushes you forward in life? Good question. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, for me, uh, my sense of purpose comes from my faith, but the purpose that I have that I apply to what I do is being of service and adding value. Mm -hmm. And that could be through what I do at McGee Productivity Solutions. It could be through what I do at Crawford & Gray. Mm -hmm. It could be just meeting people on the street and the way that I treat them, um, how I treat people that are checking me out at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. It's all about just having a, a, um, a adding value and just being a good person. And from that, everything kind of stems. Uh, people that I network with are very familiar with my approach on that. Um, I just want to learn everything about their business yeah. and how can I help them? Mm -hmm. How can I add value? How can I support them? It's a lot less about, you know, what, what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that answer because that's pretty much my answer. Um, I'm here. I'm a helper. Um, uh, actually, my Enneagram is reformer, uh, but my second is helper. So I'm a huge helper, and I just want to see people move forward, whatever they're doing in their lives, uh, whether it's exercise or sleep or business or whatever. I just want to encourage people and move them forward. Yeah. I think that's pretty much sums up. Like, that's... That's what gets me going. Being a good person. Yeah. yeah. Being a good person. I'm complimenting people on their shoes, on the trail. Like, I'm just trying to make everybody's life a little better because we have the ability to put better energy out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I do spend a lot of time just trying to figure out how I can be more positive for people. That's good. And just on both of those points, just mm -hmm. to add in, there was a time where I went 10 months without a job. And just from, and I frequent Chipotle, because A, it's delicious. B, if you work out, it's good for you. Mm -hmm. um, and just by asking people, hey, how's your day going? I ate for free at that Chipotle for a year. They had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> and then after I got a job, I went and mm -hmm. thanked them, and it blew their minds. Yeah, it's crazy. So be a good person yep. is, is the rule of that. So now we're going to turn to Mr. Crawford. Da, 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 da. I'd be curious to know if McGee does culture diagnostics to determine which areas of training are needed for when they first engage with a new client. Um, we do, actually. Who, who sent that question? So that is Chip B. from Denver, Colorado. Great question, Chip. Um, so yes, we do. Um, last time I was on the podcast, we talked about the five disciplines that mm -hmm. McGee has. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be kind of a mantra. Now it's actually part of our offering. And everything that we do from coaching, consulting, and training falls into these five disciplines. Mm -hmm. They're alignment, accountability, workflow management, digital fluency, and well-being. And we have an assessment that we use with clients that will engage either an intact team or go company-wide, depending on how they want to do it. And it'll help us identify the areas that they can use support and mm -hmm. which one of those disciplines it falls into. That is what tees us up for which programs to offer from the start. Mm -hmm. 
So there is that. Um, each one of those assessments are customized towards that client. Mm -hmm. um, but even beyond that, you know, some of that is really intuitive in the conversations that you're having with the decision makers at the client, especially mm -hmm. in smaller firms. Um, so sometimes an assessment is helpful. Sometimes it's really you just talk to some key people and you've done the assessment. You know, you know what they need. And from there, you can build upon it from there. I love that. But yeah, that's a great question. There you go. Also, for our podcast live people um, or Facebook live people, if you want to pop in some questions into the comment boxes, uh, we'll do our best to get to those also. I'll be checking those occasionally. So for Jamie mm -hmm. from Sir Brandon Reigns. No, Mr. Brandon Reigns. Mr. Brandon Reigns. Esquire. <laughs> also a veteran of the podcast. Yes, right? also yes. podcast twice. veteran. He's been on yeah. twice. He flipped the, the, the script on you. He sure yeah. did. I need to post more of those clips. <laughs> I'm going to do that today. Sure. Let's stream you more other people, please. What is the future of taxes? Who the, the future of taxes. Um, really, accounting is changing tax and accounting um, work is changing from commodity um, to consulting. Um, we have spent many years um, cranking out tax returns as a business model, um, and we're seeing huge shifts to, um, to more consulting models because the intelligence is going to start doing it for us. Um, with the invention of blockchain um, and our turbo taxes and um, you know just everybody getting into the tax space now, um, we're really looking at tax and accounting people being, um, being consultants around numbers instead of just um, tax shops or just, you know, number crunchers. Um, we're seeing a lot more personality coming out in that, which is great. Um, it's not just your accountants with your pocketbooks um, with their little things anymore. You know, it's people with personality really digging into businesses um, with the business owners. So I'm excited for that. I've been watching this happen. It's something that I've loved to do. So it's really nice to watch other people doing it also. Um, this is just the models are shifting, um, and it's one of those adapt or die kind of situations. Excellent, excellent. I'm off camera now, but I'm still going to ask the next question when I come back on. The next question is for Stephen Crawford. Dude, that voice. <laughs> Have you ever done radio or acting, or are you considering it? Um, I assumed that question was for you, yeah, <laughs> not for it me. It must have been. Nobody's going to call you dude, right? <laughs> it um, happens. Actually, I did do a little bit of amateur acting back in the day, like all through high school and college and a little bit of community theater, and I really loved it. And, yeah. I, and I actually think that that um, really helped me in my career down the road with public speaking mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Um, I don't think that there was a future in it for me because so easily typecast, you know, you, Big, ugly dude with a big voice who can't <laughs> sing. You know, there's pretty limited roles for a guy like that. I just I mean, need to teach you to sing. Yeah. Well, well, the one time I did have to sing was a production of Peter Pan, and I was Captain Hook. And I had more songs than anybody in the, in the show, but I was supposed to suck at singing because I was a pirate, right? Mm -hmm. So it worked out fine. But um, I did enjoy it. I wouldn't, you know, if something came along where it was a good role and I had the time for it or could make the time for it, I'd love to do it. But... It's not a career aspiration or anything like that. I mean, like Sylvester Stallone and Arnold pulled it off. That's, that's true. Saying. That's true. <laughs> they pulled uh, it off. As far as radio goes, um, I'd love to, you know, do radio. Maybe that's a quasi-retirement type thing. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to give up what I'm doing now to make that a full-time gig. Mm -hmm. But I'd sit in on a radio show anytime. I think that'd be a blast. Yeah. I actually know a couple of radio people. Yeah. Clients of mine. Yeah. I feel Let's like I it. should make this connection. Yeah. Right on. We if need they more, need a voiceover we need, guy We need or more Stephen Crawford voicing. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I can't remember what radio station, but I do the TV commercials for oh, Colorado cool. Dragon Festival. Dragon Boat Festival. Oh, yeah. And so we work with the radio stations and local TV stations. Voiceovers. And that was from Holly C. Okay. in Aurora. 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 Ooh, here we go. I think this one is for Probably both so. of you. Yeah. How do you reinstall company and team alignment after a disruptive event, like an unforeseen transition, employee exit, et cetera? And this is from Be Bethany C. Bethany was actually one of my birth doula clients. Oh, there you go. I'm going to let you answer that okay. one. <laughs> I'm kicking uh, that one to you. So there's a lot of times when organizations... Um, either they have a good culture going or they don't. And then something happens like uh, an M&A, you know, mm -hmm. the merger acquisition or key people leave. 
And the question asks, you know, how do you reinstall alignment after that? And some of the key things, one of our programs is, is based around that. It's mm-hmm. a strategic team plan that's also called our alignment plan. And it really gets everybody there centered in on what the organizational goals are, Mm -hmm. how those roll down into team goals and individual goals and gets everybody aligned. And alignment is different than agreement. And some people don't understand the difference between those two. Mm -hmm. I can agree with you, but still in the back of my head being like, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So I agree with you that this is the goal, but I'm not aligned to it. I'm Mm -hmm. already making excuses for why I'm not going to hit it. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways to get people aligned is that they fully understand it and that they buy into it and they verbally align to that and Mm -hmm. commit to it. And then you have things that are set up so that you can track your progress towards those individual goals and therefore how you're doing as a team at Mm -hmm. an org. But that's at a high level and that that's kind of a, a structural approach. Another thing that's important is getting key people involved in the decision-making process and mm-hmm. in the process of aligning on those goals and determining those goals. And when I say key people, I don't just mean leaders. Mm-hmm. I tell my clients, when we're going to um, put change in your organization, who's going to be the two or three people who are going to make the most noise? Mm-hmm. Who's the people who are going to gather a choir mm-hmm. around them to say that this is a bunch of BS? Mm-hmm. We want those people involved in the decision. They're like, wait a minute, why would we want them? They're the naysayers. Because if you get them involved from the start and they're part of the solution and they have an input, even if it's not going exactly the way they wanted to, Mm -hmm. they were still heard and part of that decision making Mm -hmm. that they're going to endorse that now. Mm -hmm. And when they're out there on the floor endorsing it and everybody else sees that, Mm -hmm. that's a good thing. And that, that would be the difference between the leaders of the business and the leaders of the people. That's right. That's right. That's and sometimes, you know, that per, those people or that person um, that can build a choir, they have the respect of the people on the floor for one reason or the other, mm-hmm. even if they're recognized as being somebody who's always, you know, anti-everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but when they're bought in and they're out there mm-hmm. championing it, that's a loud voice. Mm-hmm. That really prevents things from, from rotting. So actually it was in a business where we did some – like software changes, and one person just hated it. Hated it, um, and it just became this huge, massive issue, um, and it basically rotted the whole. Like this person oh. had the ability to rot. I mean, he rotted three or other four other employees, or literally was like seven of us at yeah. the time. Um, it was a horrible situation, and it's just like, how do you how do you manage that from the front side? That's a really good question. Um, there's actually another question that feeds into that one. Watch me take over. <laughs> well, while you're finding that, you know, one thing I would say in that in that specific situation, because I've seen that in my mm-hmm. previous life as well mm-hmm. with, you know, the 20 years I spent in BPO with large mm-hmm. offices. And, you know, as a coach, I would, I would get with that person and find mm-hmm. out what that real resistance is. Mm-hmm. What is the limiting belief that that person has? Because mm-hmm. typically... I wouldn't say 100%, but I'd say a high percentage of that has nothing to do with technology. Right. It's their resistance to change. It's how they're personally feeling about it, Mm -hmm. how they're internalizing this. Um, So what is that? And then how can you get them past that limiting belief and get them to be a champion for it and see what the value is for them and taking that next step with it? Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of times people don't go that far. They just say, okay, well, he's just a grumpy old guy and he's just going to hate whatever we do. Mm -hmm. Right. Well. Then it festers, like you yeah. said, and now it just ruined the whole thing. Whereas if somebody would have taken that time to coach with them mm-hmm. and find out that, you could have made an impact. Um, so on the same vein, I actually grabbed those because yes. I know there's another question here about this. Um, when acquiring a new business, what suggestions do you have about raising expectations among team member members and getting buy-in for a new vision for the company? That's from Marty here in Denver. Um so he's bought a new business and he wants to know how you take take the employees that are already there and change manage for a new vision mm-hmm. which seems almost seem, that seems, seems really difficult. hard that seems yeah. really difficult, difficult maybe yeah. potentially well you know impossible. it really kind of depends on the type of the company and and the people there mm-hmm. if it's a, a values based business a business that has a mission mm-hmm. and those missions are similar mm-hmm. and the people that are there are driven that way, purpose-driven people mm-hmm. and mission-driven people, it's a little bit easier because, you know, you're just reframing what that mission is. You're getting them bought in on that. And mm-hmm. They're driven that way. If it's, you know, XYZ company and you're making widgets and there's no, not a whole lot of mission um, mm-hmm. in there, create one. 
get something that will get everybody, the new folks that you've acquired and mm-hmm. the people that you have existing, mm-hmm. go in the same direction and get their buy-in on it, go through that process. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our, our cultivated accountability program would be one where I would go in there with these groups of people that have already aligned on what their vision and goals are mm-hmm. and help them on how they're going to measure that and hold each other accountable. And when I say hold each other accountable, it's not, you know, popping somebody on the head saying you're not getting your job done. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's a different thing. Accountability is different. And how do you hold yourself accountable and each other accountable towards this mission that you all align to? And that gets people feeling like they're part of the fold. Yeah. One of the biggest fears that people have when they're, they've been acquired, mm-hmm. their company has been, or they're with the existing company that acquired mm-hmm. another company is now everything's going to change because yeah. mm-hmm. there's going to be these guys wanting to do it their way. These guys want to do it their way, which way is the right way. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you can get out of the triangle of blame and get out of right and wrong mm-hmm. and just say, what is the best way for the org? And let's mm-hmm. get around that. Mm-hmm. Um, get out of that individual thinking into org thinking. And then you can get moved past those challenges. That's really good. But it's an exercise and you have to dedicate the time mm-hmm. and you have to have the focus on it. Giving it lip service and you know saying, hey, we're going to get everybody's buy-in and mm-hmm. all that, that's the wrong message because it's not a democracy. Mm-hmm. I'm not getting everybody's vote here and we're just going to say, okay, majority wins. Mm-hmm. We're going to do what's right by the business. But I do want to hear all your ideas and incorporate those as mm-hmm. best we can. Mm-hmm. Right, so it, it needs to be clear up front, and you need to spend the time and put the effort in for it. I like that answer. How do you think throwing in as incentives, maybe monetary or other things, to help those people maybe maybe change the culture that was there? Does that have a lasting effect? Sure. If um, if there was a challenge with that at the previous company, that would be seen as something as an upside for them mm-hmm. with the new organization. Hey, our comp package is better, mm-hmm. and you know, ideally, you'd love to do that anyway. Right. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, making budgetary decisions and cost right after an acquisition like that's hard to do mm-hmm. yeah. because you, you haven't seen ROI on the money you just spent on this yet. Um, if your benefits package and your comp package is better than what they had already and they're just folding into that, good for them. Yeah. Um, if it's not, you know, then that's even a harder challenge. Right. <laughs> yeah. So there is other ways to, to make it a place that they want to stay working at outside of compensation. And that is. Oh, yeah hearing them, you know, it's not about ping pong tables in a break room, right? It's about them being able to be engaged here Mm -hmm. in Colorado. For sure. We're blessed with a lot of organizations that are very environmentally focused that Mm -hmm. want to do things for their community. So sometimes it's saying, Hey, you know, two paid days a month that you can go out and do volunteer work. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a benefit because people are able to do things that they love and contribute to their organization or to their community and the organization supporting that. Yeah. And it's not taking them from budget. Then you hire a guy like me to make them more productive. You don't miss those two days, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So then bouncing to Jamie, mm-hmm. what advice do you have for a CPA stuck in a chop shop but not sure they're ready to go out on their own? And that is from Susan K. in North Glen, Colorado. Um, Susan, send me an email. We'll talk about this more in depth. Um Chop shop. I'm assuming that means a tax shop. So a chop shop. We're just chopping stuff up and filing it. And that's what I'm assuming you mean by that. Um, what advice do I have? My advice would be to figure out who you like to serve um, and what services you like to provide. Uh, because there's so many options. Um, I've spent five years kind of spinning wheels, um, quite honestly, just trying to figure out what I want to do, who I want to do it for. Um, and how we want to serve people, um, and what's the best way we serve people. Um, The other thing I would probably recommend is some business classes, because even as CPAs, we really don't know how to run businesses. Um, So that's really, really important. And honestly, just do it. Um, Create, you know, create an offering and try to go sell it, Um, and then see how it goes. I like that. Hopefully you don't have an non-compete. (laughs) <laughs> just do it just do it just do it bouncing back over to mr crawford what advice do you have for young leaders in both corporations and small businesses leadership is a, is a big thing right and a lot of people have different interpretations of what that yeah. is what the definition is what a good leader looks like and all that as far as young people new to business like coming out of college or the military or you know right out of high school into the professional space or business new business leaders One of the main things that is constant in people that are successful leaders is authenticity. Mm -hmm. Um, 
being true to themselves. So I would say have a, have a strong sense of what your values are and stay true to those in your business. And if you do that and you surround yourself with people that have similar values, um, you're going to find success mm -hmm. one way or the other. It's so hard. So I, I have struggled um, or initially struggled with the values conversation um, because when we start businesses or like we start in a company that we don't like we don't a lot of we don't have like schooling around what our values look like mm. um so there's a lot of exercises to figure out your values but taking the time to do that and really kind of hash out what do i believe what's important to me all of those things um it's a hard exercise and it's a, an evolving exercise mm -hmm. like when kind of come out differently every time i do it but i think I think that's the thing we're all kind of missing is how are we authentic if we don't know our values, but right. how do we learn our, value, our right. values? Um, so the Simex, Simon, Simon Sinek's um, Big Why stuff is mm. kind of good. Right. I kind of like, that's kind of where I started. Um, our friend Nora Abel here in Denver does unique contribution workshops, super powerful workshops, really helpful with um, values and you know understanding who you are and how you work and all those things. I also love like every personality test out there. If you take all of that information, like I'm super data driven, so I'm like, how do I find out my values? Right. Like, can I take a test? <laughs> um, so, you know, trying to hash those out is really, really important. Um, but also sitting down with your team or whoever you're working with. And I mean, even just having a list and having people circle them is a really, really good exercise. Mm -hmm. And leverage your family and friends, yeah. people that have known you the longest. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. Um, I think all of us would be, if we reached out to one of our oldest longtime friends or mm -hmm. maybe one of our parents mm -hmm. and said, you know, if you were to list what my top three values were, what would you say they were? Mm -hmm. And they'll bring up anecdotes and stories about, you know, well, I, th I think that, you know, you're a compassionate person. And mm -hmm. I'd be like, really? I never really considered myself all that compassionate. I mean, I'm nice enough, but mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, you know, kissing babies and saving dogs, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, you know, they'll tell you a story, then I'll give you another example, they'll give you mm -hmm. another example, and you're like, wow, yeah, so I guess I just didn't frame it in that word, mm -hmm. you know? And so asking people that know you well is a good way I to kind of that. get a sense. And then also identify what you would aspire to. Mm -hmm. Don't limit yourself to what, you know, you ultimately boil down to saying, these are what my values are, what I've represented. Mm -hmm. What do I want my values to be as well? And, and what do I need to do to aspire to be that? Yeah, those are so good. Um, I actually did that exercise. I emailed people um, and asked them in my personal life and in my work life to, to say how I've contributed, basically. Um, and it was really, really powerful. If just asking people how they see how you show up mm -hmm. really does kind of help you figure out, oh. And then you look at those and you're like, oh, duh. Yeah, sure. Totally. Yeah. Totally am those things. All yeah. those things. That's amazing. Yeah, but be careful because you might get some things you don't want to hear too. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah, so be prepared. This right? is also true. But it's just, you know, around that whole thing about creating values, there's lots of approaches to it. But mm -hmm. the key is when, when you land on something that you're really using as your core, mm -hmm. Um, stay true to that. It's so easy to say, okay, well, my business is up and running. These are the values that I hold personally to mm -hmm. me. And I have an opportunity for my business to grow to the next level, but I have to compromise one of those values. Mm -hmm. In the long run, that's not going to serve you. Right. Um, so just stay away from that. Stay true to your values. I really, really like that. That's Be who you are. True. Yes. And kind of feeding into that, <clears throat> the next question. <laughs> I just have like floating head, floating voice. <laughs> Just as I gotta it is. make sure everything's running You're good. I know. Well. You do your job. <laughs> um, how do you view firing a team member that is not a good fit for the business, but is bringing in the money? Mm. Who is that question from? That is from Kyle D. in my hometown of Dallas, Texas. I don't know. Who um, I'm gonna let Steven answer this one, but I also think that if you if you don't have alignment, regardless of how much money somebody's bringing in, they're not creating positively to the mission, vision, value. It's just not going to work in the long run. You're going to have to fire them eventually, yeah. probably, if they can't get get in the line. And sooner the better. Um, the The message you're sending every day you let that person stay on board is that if you bring in the money, you can get away with whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And that's the culture that you're building. While you might set your business back financially for a month or two while you replace mm -hmm. that production, 
the dedication and respect you're going to have from the rest of the people on the, in the company and on that team mm -hmm. is going to be immense. Mm -hmm. um, they recognize that. And so many organizations today, you can walk in there and ask people and they'll be like, oh yeah, well, that guy, he's, you know, he's got the golden ticket. He can do whatever he wants because he's the number one sales guy. Mm -hmm. And that demotivates everybody else. And it also sets the expectation that you could be a jerk as long as you're producing. And they'll respect you for pulling the trigger, making the sacrifice for the volume um, if the person's not the right person. That's so true. I was back to the organization that I was in where the, the bad apple basically poisoned the bunch and it took forever for the upper management to fire that person. Mm -hmm. um, and so that person was really able to rot mm -hmm. two other people mm -hmm. in the process. Um, so you, not only did you lose one person, you actually lost three people right. um, because they all had to go yeah, at the, the same time. The one caveat I would say is, you know, the question said once you've determined that that person is absolutely not it, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the caveat is I always give people the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. to start and look at myself and say, okay, have I done what I need to do to make mm -hmm. sure this person is set up for success? Right. Have I looked into what might be causing this behavior to see if I can help that first? Mm -hmm. And if you've done what you can do, do and you've invested in them and they're not giving their part of it and the behavior is still there, you got to let them go sooner than later. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love like a 30 day, you know, here's what needs to change. Like sitting down with that person, having a really good talk with them saying, you know, this is what I need from Like this is what needs to happen, you know, that's to move this business forward and to move you forward to your goals. Here's our, you know, here's our accountability bit. So let's get this done. How do you need us? How, how can we help you? How can we be there for you? What do you need? Yeah. You know, yeah. how do we get there? And then um, I had somebody who I did that. I sat down with her. I'm like, what is going on? Like, things were great. No, they're not. What's happening? You know, here's what, you know, here's what I think needs to happen. What do you think needs to happen? Here's the dates on those things. And she didn't hit the first metric. She was gone. Yep. You know, you don't care. And that's yeah. fine, but I'm not going to sit here and try to move you along exactly. and move you towards your goals if you're not, don't have any Making buying. sure those things are measurable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. right, is key. Mm -hmm. uh, making sure they clearly understand that, mm -hmm. that you understand what they need, mm -hmm. right? And that is, you know, it's about knowing where you stand at all times, yeah. mm -hmm. both positive and, and, you know, corrective, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, if people know where they stand, then they're in control for what actions they're going to take next. Yep. If they're surprised by a bad review or mm -hmm. when you're calling them into the office to fire them, mm -hmm. that's not cool, right? Mm -hmm. they, that means you haven't done anything to try to improve that behavior. Right. Um, same thing if they're surprised when you're being considered for a promotion. They're like, I didn't know I was valued like that in this organization. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. Right. How come you didn't know you were that valued? Right. You know, so it's about communication and making sure people that. know where they stand. And that's why, you know, team accountability is so important because it forces that communication and that feedback all the time where everybody knows where they stand 24 seven. And so Jamie said she liked the 30 day. How long do you like? Um, I don't, I don't like a time frame at all. Just whatever. When it's, when it's corrective like that, because if I was to sit down with somebody and say, here's the 30 day plan and you have to meet these metrics. And then if not in 30 days, I'm going to, you know, mm -hmm. you're out the door. Right. Um, if they're slumping and they're not really making a lot of progress, mm -hmm you might see progress and you might feel, all right, they're making the effort, mm -hmm. right? They're getting towards there at two weeks in. They mm -hmm. still have a shot. Mm -hmm. They might look at that and say, I'm not even close in two weeks, so they're going to fire me anyway, so mm -hmm. I'm just going to start dumping stuff, right? And they're already on their way out the door. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I set up, you know, every few days a touch base mm -hmm. and say, here's what ultimately I need this, us to get to. Mm -hmm. I don't know when we're going to get there, but I, I, let's see what our progress mm -hmm. is and let's measure it. Right, mm -hmm. it's got to be measurable. Okay, well, you've made some incremental efforts here, but here, 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 you haven't. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it you're trying to do? Why is it not working? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not really trying to do anything here, or yeah. I, I don't, I don't align with that. I don't think I really need to do that. Peace out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, I've done it on 30 mm -hmm. days. I've done it on 15 days. That's mm -hmm. HR directed. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the 30 day plans mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But in a perfect world, I wouldn't have. Um, you know, that long a time out. Yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, what I tried to do um, is make sure there was like some kind of measurable every week so mm -hmm. that like we could reevaluate, like yeah. reevaluate every week and How like see doing? some progress. Yeah, like, are. you know, like the first deliverable was a list of trainings you need. Like yeah. we're, you know, like there's are some of the holes we've. Let me know what you yeah, need. Yeah, these are some of the holes. Um, You know, what do you feel like you need so you can move forward? Um, I need a list of trainings. Like that was the first deliverable. Didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, so yeah, that's like I'm here. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's clear that they're not bought in. Yeah. Right? So. <laughs> so that answered two questions. Yay! So both of them were from Kyle D in Dallas. Um, backing up though, I have a follow up that I want to ask about um, somebody not being a good fit, but they're bringing in the money. So for somebody who is thinking about the money and that's what they're worried about, and we talked about being a fit for the culture, that might not hit them, but. <clears throat> When we have somebody dragging down the entire team, but one person bringing in money, how much money is being lost by the rest of the team being dragged down? That's right. And does that replace that person mm -hmm. altogether? Yeah, so that's a good way to look at it, right? So being able to lift up the other people because the negative force is out of there is pretty impactful. You know, but as a business leader, I would ask myself, um, I'd be very careful about this. You know, yeah, this guy's bringing in all this money and, you know, this is how it's impacting other people. I really need to get rid of them, but I don't want to lose the money. Ask yourself what you're in business for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is your purpose in your business? What are you doing this business for? Who you're serving? Why are you doing it? And if it's all about making money, then party on. Go ahead and keep the guy because you're not going to be in business for very long anyway, mm -hmm. if that's all it's about. If you have other purpose, you have a, a meaning around why you're doing the business there, then you can easily see what aligns and what doesn't align with that. Mm -hmm. And if you've done the follow-up and the coaching with this person to try to change his or her approach and it's not working, get them out of there. Awesome. And those other people that were brought down by seeing that behavior, yeah. their production is going to rise because they're going to have a whole lot of respect for the fact that you just got rid of the guy who was bringing in all your revenue mm -hmm. because of the way that his behavior was impacting everybody else. Especially if you hold a conversation around That's it. right. Yeah, be public about it. You know, this yeah. is what's happening. Mm -hmm. So moving on to a question for both of you. What more the, Brandon Rains questions. More Brandon Rains. Back to Brandon. He gave us a lot. He, yeah, yeah, he had a ton of questions. <laughs> we appreciate you. Um, similarly, what are the disruptors that we see coming down the line for accounting and for productivity? Jamie first. Uh, I feel like I kind of talked about that earlier, but um, we're watching, uh, well, <laughs> Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Let's start there. Uh, that was a huge disruptor um, to, to pretty much how we work, how we do everything, how taxes work, how all of that. So that was a huge disruptor. So anytime Congress actually gets something done on the tax side, that's a huge disruptor. Um, technology is going to be a huge disruptor. Um, it's already a huge disruptor. Um, we actually just watched uh, Wave be purchased by H&R Block. So Wave is an accounting platform for small businesses. Not a really good one, but it, it's one that's used. Um, so we're watching we're watching the technology um, be assimilated. Be assimilated. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Here to help. Um, so that's so that's really fun um, and. Like, like I talked about before, we're watching um, we're watching our service uh, become become commodities, even more commodities that are um, done by um, that are done by software and artificial intelligence. So um, we just got to shift. We got to shift our focus. So that's the huge disruptors for us right now. And going back to the disruptors, just from our conversations, mm -hmm. there's lots of tax offices like just going, eh, nope, done. Yes. <laughs> Um, that's been really interesting to watch after the tax cuts and jobs act, um, people, be, you know, people that were close to retirement, you know, or pretty much done with the way that this, um, this industry works, uh, thrown in towels. So that was kind of interesting to watch, but, you know, tax firms have, um, have been, you know, historically really easy to buy or, you know, something that, you know, has the value and client bases have value um, just based on tax returns. Um, that's just not the case anymore. No. Uh, we're looking at really low multiples for purchase of a tax firm if you want to buy one, which I honestly can't understand why you would want to um, because you're just going to get hundreds of clients that are not going to stick around if you try to raise prices a lot of the time. So it's been, it's interesting. It's an interesting, it's an interesting industry to watch closely just because of the rapid amount of change we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And does that increase the value of a consulting service like you have? Oh yeah. So, um, you know, really the multipliers for just a tax shop is like 0.8 at this point, you can get like 0.8 of revenue for one year um and then probably lose half those clients if the person doesn't stick around yeah um but consulting businesses where you know we really have the ability 
our, you know, our ability and what we know what to do um, really lies in our ability to look at, uh, look at numbers and to understand numbers and break down numbers and help people with numbers. Um, and if we can shift to helping people uh, mitigate taxes um, and also grow their businesses at the same time and really provide that value that we're actually really, really good at if we tap into it, um, it will be more sustainable. The old adage of would you spend ten thousand dollars to save a hundred thousand? Yep. Mm -hmm. So Stephen. Uh, disruptors. I think the the biggest thing, obviously there's competition and there's technology changes and all that, but I think the thing that's impacting uh, professional services and the type of work that we do is um, the different generations and how they like to learn and how they like to absorb. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't put anybody in a box. So just because you're a quote unquote millennial doesn't mean that you learn exactly the same as all the other millennials, mm -hmm. right? But the trend is that there's a lot more need for on-demand learning self-paced stuff. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to do snippets of training, um, you know, real time when they want to. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's still a place for our live eight hour on-site trainings. Mm -hmm. And there's a place for digital learning where they can take all that same content in little pieces mm -hmm. um, from their phone or on their computer. And, you know, we're responding to that. So we've created a, a digital learning platform, online learning that um, I'm really proud of and continues to it. evolve, um, you know, but I still look at it as supplemental mm -hmm. because I think that there, you still can't replace the, you know, live instructor led um, feedback, but it is valuable and, and people are using it. So some of our clients that are adopting it now are ones who have done training for their people mm -hmm. on the Take Back Your Life uh, program, for example, and then they've bought licenses for a certain number of seats on the digital. So when they onboard, new people, mm -hmm. they can put them through that right away, oh, real you. time, and they get up to, to speed on the, the technical and the methodology around it, and they're absorbed into a culture that's already doing the stuff that they learned. So I see that's where the best place for it. But um, to answer the question, I think probably the biggest disruptor is having all the options for all the different ways that people want to learn and take training. Yeah, I'm a I'm a snippet learner. Like if you have an online, you know, training or whatever, I'm I'm in. Yep. And I'm not technically a millennial. Mm -hmm. Um, we have people. You're close enough. I include you. Um. So, but yeah, people do learn differently. I'm actually going to a three day like tax planning intensive, and it's eight hours a day, and I'm a little afraid. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how my brain does. Yeah, everybody does learn differently, you know. But and how you absorb content. But, you know, the, the thing to me that is important about that as far as, you know, a disruptor is you can have your opinions on what is the best way. Mm -hmm. I can have my opinion on what the best way for, you know, mm -hmm. facilitating is or the best way people should learn. And it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what I think. Mm -hmm. It's what is my client wanting, what is the, the customer base mm -hmm. need. And you need to be able to accommodate for all that. Right. So we've done a really great job of having, you know, all kinds of, live instructor led on site and then there's you know digital uh, that i just spoke about that there's also virtual live so you can have an instructor do virtual training so oh, okay. trying to meet all those needs i love it yeah. yes uh, i have one more that i want to give to you okay what advice do you have for a small business small businesses who struggle with the cost of a professional cpa firm but definitely need the support uh, make more money and pay <laughs> your tax people um <laughs> Decide what your priorities are, I guess. Um, you that really. Is, sorry, from Tony B from Chicago. Tony B. Um, I think because we look at, because I've talked about tax stuff being commodities, you know, um, QuickBooks Online now has their own bookkeeping service. I honestly couldn't tell you how good it is. Um, and we have TurboTax telling you that you can do your own taxes. Um, what are you saving? Um, are you saving time? Are you saving money by outsourcing? those um those services um are you gaining somebody who can help you better with your numbers um i think it's it's a reframing of this is just an expense um that i'm not getting any value out of um it's saying you know i need i need somebody to help me with my taxes i need somebody to help me with my bookkeeping i need somebody to be finding those expenses i'm missing i need somebody to find the tax stuff i'm missing um because as tax people, our job is to help you save money. Um, and we, a lot of the time we're doing that without communicating it. 
Um, that's something I'm working on is mm-hmm. letting people know, oh, we spent a couple extra hours on your tax return, but we saved you, you know, we saved you eighteen thousand dollars by doing a little bit of extra research. So it's that communication of what you're really getting in um, in those services. Um, but if you want the services, you need to figure out a way to pay for them because raise we're prices, experts. Yeah, raise your yeah. prices. That's all stuff we could talk you through also. Yeah. Well, and I would submit one thing too for uh, Tony. You know, if you're considering um, a CPA because you just want somebody to do the numbers, mm-hmm. um, like you said, that's a commodity mm-hmm. and you can find that elsewhere. What value are you getting for the cost mm-hmm. in consulting? Mm-hmm. And not only saying, here, I can save you more money, but here's what you should be doing mm-hmm. going forward exactly. to tee you up for next year exactly. and coaching along the way. And I'm accessible to you throughout the year, mm-hmm. right? That's a value add that you have mm-hmm. that, you know, uh, a, the one lady called it a chop shop, mm-hmm. right? Uh, one of those one and done type mm-hmm. accounting places is going to give you that. No, they're not. So what are, what are your ex- expectations? What are you getting for value for that cost? Mm-hmm. Instead of just looking at it as I'm getting my numbers done. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that's the big piece people don't, don't really understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have the way that we do things is we're on a monthly, we're monthly payment. So, you're supposed to call us. You're supposed to email us. We are accessible to you because you pay us monthly. And that's why I do that so that people can ask us questions at any time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that we can also be giving, you know, real-time feedback Mm -hmm. on things Um, because we want to be part of your advisory board. Like that's our job. Um, Our job isn't to just data entry for you. Right. And when you're engaged in the business throughout the year like that, Um, when it comes time to put all that stuff together, you have a working knowledge of that business. Mm-hmm. It's not like you have to study on 60 businesses in November to figure out how you're going to do their taxes, mm-hmm. right? So you have a, a relationship, a working knowledge. Mm-hmm. You've coached them along the way. You know mm-hmm. what types of changes they've made. Right. We know That's their goals. Right? We know their, where they want to go. Awesome. Um, you know, we know how to, you know, help them on whatever it is. Um, that they need help with. Um, and then we're also looking at things and being like, okay, I told you, you have to do your miles. Like we've had this mm-hmm. conversation five or six right. times. You know, this isn't something new. We're not blindsiding you with, Having that accountability you know, yeah, more right. compliance or accountability or things like that. You know, we're helping you as we go. Yeah. Well, excellent. Well, thank you too. Thank you. Thank you. Answering all these questions. Do we get we any had, Facebook live questions? We have a whole lot more questions on here that we didn't get to. <laughs> so many questions. So we might have to we'll do have this to again. Do it. We're going to have to do this again. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and we'll tag everybody that asked questions that got answers to it. Mm-hmm. That sort of fun stuff. I didn't awesome. see anything come through on the Facebook live. Awesome. But thank you guys for paying attention. And uh, thank you. Yeah, we'll do it again. Thank <laughs> you yeah. both. Yeah, thank Great you job both. hosting right. too, Steve. Yeah, good good work. <laughs>